I'm Ned Jerry. From Papyrus, this is NASCAR Racing. at the Darlington Raceway in the small town of Darlington, South Carolina. You can see there are 43 cars ready to do battle here today for one of the most grueling races on the entire NASCAR Peak Ada Free Series schedule. It will be a long day of crashes, a long day of endurance, and at the end of the day, somebody will walk home with a large trophy and a possible championship check worth over $10,000. My name is Tony Stevens. Joining me in the booth momentarily will be Joe Cortez as we cover tonight's action at the Peak 250, first the Peak Southern 250 here at the Darlington Raceway. Coming into tonight, there is a championship battle on hand between drivers Kenny Humphy and Ray Alfala. Of course, Alfala is back about two and a half races worth of points to Kenny Humphy. Tonight's championship could be decided coming in at the end of tonight's event with still two races left to go in the state of Illinois at Chicagoland Speedway and in Florida in four weeks time at the Homestead Miami Speedway. Anyway, back to the back to the normal style of broadcast. We got into the throwbacks here. A couple of big stories coming into tonight. We do have the dynamic track set. The new physics brought to you by iRacing. It's going to be a very, very different race from what we've ever seen before and going to be very fun, no doubt, and very interesting. This could be a whole new ball game once 250 miles are complete tonight. And, of course, you'll notice a lot of throwback schemes, all kinds of inspirations from racing uncles to racing foundations to racing pioneers to throwback finishes at Darlington. We'll see a lot of them over the course of the night. Thanks for joining us. The cars get ready to go to the grid. And Joe, it's certainly going to be a fun one here tonight. Darlington always is. And as we saw a couple, as we saw a couple weeks ago, uh, what Darlington, what we know about Darlington is this is the most unpredictable track of them all. No matter what happens here, no matter what you think you see on TV, this track is definitely just definitely uh, an anomaly in the field. Let's go and take you through the tonight's starting lineup tonight on the pole. The man who has a chance, who who has a chance of. Winning tonight's race, Kenny Humpy, Nick Ottinger on the outside of him, makes up row number one. Matt Busa, Corey Vincent, and Patrick Crabtree will make up the top five. BJ Sturgis, Brad Mahar, Ray Alfala, Brad Davies, and Brad Davies make up your top ten. And it's Justin Bolton, Casey Tucker, Cody Bias, Tyler Hudson, and Alan Bowes starting 15. Alex Scribner, Adam Gillen, Ben Burmeister, Taylor Hurst, Ryan Lowe, your top 20. Rob Ackley will be in the number 22, Alex Warren in the 82, Shane Doherty, Brian Blackford, and Tyler Laughlin in the 25th. 26 through 30 are in this order, Brandon Schmidt, Chris Overland, Kevin King, Andy Fash the third, and Brandon Bowie. David Rattler, Landon Harrison, Tyler Hill, Jake Sturgis, and Michael Conti make up the next handful. Nathan Wise, Tim Volan, Trey Eidson, Brian Day, Danny Hansen, and Steven Gilbert round out the field of 41 tonight as the pace car gets the heck out of the way to let these guys do what they do best. Kenny Humpy won here two weeks ago in the in the B-Series. Can you win your win? All the marbles are on the line. Green flag flies for the first of 183 laps around this iconic track, and Humpy's nowhere to be seen. 
it very quickly. Kenny Humpy on the jump. In fact, he's out a good 10 car lengths. Over second place, Nick Ottinger running one of the throwback schemes here tonight. We'll talk about some of those as we continue on here this evening. But this race, Joe, a long, grueling marathon. 183 laps makes up the 250-mile distance of the peak Southern 250 here at the Lady in Black. Darlington Raceway and very quickly, again, the entire field single file for the most part. It's simply about racing the racetrack here, not racing the competition. Well, with, and as you mentioned, the onset of this race, with the addition of these dynamic tracks, the track will change as these drivers continue through all 183 laps here at Darlington. So the track it is continually changing lap after lap for these guys. This is going to be a new test for these drivers. As you see now, the two of Ray Alfala wasting no time getting around Michael J. Johnson. Alfala moves up to seven. Hey, it looks like he's a little comfortable with these dynamic tracks already. Well, Joe, that's one of the things. These guys have had about a week or so to get used to this now. This race was scheduled originally a week from tonight, the day the new build was released here at iRacing, which means there's not a lot of practice time. I don't care what you're racing, bicycles, race cars, pack your potato sacks, whatever. You need to get some practice and get familiar with what you're going to be competing with. And guess what? This is exactly what they did. They got enough practice to play up this dynamic track deal. And what this means, Joe, is now we're going to see the groove move around over the course of the night. We're going to see the car's handling change, not based off of how you burn the tires off, but based off of things like where the rubber is out on the racetrack, where the cool spots and the hot spots are on the racetrack. So you're gonna see cars moving maybe on the bottom of turns one and two at the halfway point of the race, and then back to the top. We really don't know. It's a big question mark, but it certainly is one I think a lot of drivers are looking forward to trying to tackle here tonight. Trouble early on the track now. Looks like the 74 Taylor Hurst and the, uh, I believe the 66 machine, uh, Benjamin Burmeister, may have gotten together there a couple laps ago. Both those cars still running forward in the right direction, so the yellow flag stays inside the uh, flag stand right this second. But right now, all eyes are on Kenny Humpy as he's got a huge lead on the rest of this field, Tony. That last time around, it was two, it was a uh, one and a half seconds in front of Nick Ottinger. Corey Vincent, BJ Sturgis and company, he's got a huge lead on them. And again, Kenny Gumby is very comfortable at this track. He won it two weeks ago. He said he had a lot of, uh, of confidence coming in here. And tonight could be the night he catches a $10,000 check. But Joe, here's the thing. This race is a long marathon. Anything can happen. And yes, it's the same location, but this is a very different racetrack. As you mentioned, the dynamic track model now in iRacing, we don't know what this track's going to do in 10 laps, 20 laps, 100 laps. We have no clue. These drivers think they know what it's going to do, but again, they really don't know exactly what's going to happen. So as this race plays out, it's going to be fun to see how, in fact, it does affect drivers like Kenny Humphrey or Corey Benson or P.J. Sturgis, who are out front early. I'm looking at somebody like Nick Ottinger. You look back at Matt Busa racing alongside Patrick Crabtree and others, but you look further back there, and Nick Ottinger's just kind of been playing the move over game, Joe. And it reminds me back when Mark Mark and Jeff Burton were so good here back in the former Bush series, now it's Finney series, where they would just be nowhere the first half of the race. And all of a sudden, as the rubber laid down, the track came to them. Where were they? Up front, dominating the race. Nick Ottinger pulling the, uh, the old Detroit gasket paint scheme out of the woodwork. That was his great uncle, L.D. Ottinger, who was so, so good in the uh, mountains, basically, of Northeast Tennessee and Western North Carolina and the old Bush Series, now Xfinity Series. Uh, he's pulling that out for a little bit of luck. And if you know L.D. Ottinger, he was a legend in his time. And even Nick Ottinger trying to pull a little of that out himself here at the Lady in Black. You can never have too much luck uh, at the Lady in Black just because, uh, again, as now we have problems with the track car 15 as Patrick Crabtree looks like he's able to almost lose it off of turn number four, able to save it though, and now he got more trouble on the track. Ryan Lowe just about ran him over when he came back up into the groove, Joe, but luckily he was on the binders very quickly, avoided the incident, and we will continue on under green, but a lot of near misses so far here early. 
There were a couple of drivers, Joe, I know in private conversations that said they just could not get a hold of this thing, this new dynamic track model. In fact, one driver who his name I won't mention, he's not in the field tonight, but he has been a NASCAR Pekana Free Series driver for the last few years. He said, after 10 laps, I'm just wrecking loose. No matter what I do, I can't keep the right rear on it. So there's a bit of a learning curve here, Joe. And again, it makes it very, very interesting to see how it all plays out as Alan Bowes now having some problems in his number 21 trying to keep the thing between the walls. Yeah, he made contact going into turn number four with Michael J. Johnson in front of him. And it looks like the 05 of Ottinger had some problems last time around. He was down low coming out of turns number one or three and four, but he will rescue it. He will be going back in the right direction. He drops from second to seventh in a matter of a couple laps there. In turn number four, I want to pay particularly close attention to that turn number three and four, especially transitioning out of turn number four. When we raced this track two weeks ago, that was a part everyone seemed to have problems with. And if you didn't cause a big wreck out of that turn, you definitely had a situation where you were potentially spinning it or getting loose or end up in the inside wall as a, as coming out of turn number four. So if you're going to see trouble tonight, we're going to see it right there. And Joe, problems for Ryan Lowe. He got loose coming out of turn number four. Did not have a spot to slide up in line. And he's been running the apron the last almost, almost full. I mean, whoa, watch out, Brad Mahar. Hard, hard spin for Brad Mahar here in the front straightaway, but we will stay green, Joe. And uh, that's a tough break for Brad Mahar. Brad Mahar, we stay green, even though Brad Mahar went basically tail first into the inside wall of the safer barrier. Taking a look back at that incident, it looks like he just hooked it out of turn number four and off the 27, the nose of the 27 machine that belongs to Cody Bias. Mahar will go spinning around, goes tail first into that safer barrier. And even if he's able to rescue that car, he's going to have no downforce as a result of that tail end being basically destroyed on that car. So, uh, Mahar, uh, count him out for this for the night because I don't think there's a lot, whole lot he can do now to salvage his evening. He is going to need a lot of help, no doubt. As, uh, hello, watch out. <laughs> a little tight there. I'm going to put bias his car there. And that was just about... Uh, not so pleasant, but Joe, that's part of the nature of Darlington. This racetrack was never meant to be run the way that it's currently run. That banked part we see that everybody races on now, that was originally meant to be the safety apron. That was only a couple of lanes wide. They were supposed to race down the flat part, Joe, but uh, we see how that did not work out. And there's a lot of, speaking of going back in the day and, and looking at the history of this racetrack here in Darlington, you mentioned at the outset a lot, a lot of vintage type schemes or vintage inspired schemes on the racetrack. The first of which is number two of Ray Alfala. He is one of two Wendell Scott inspired schemes on the racetrack. And that car is pretty much same font, same colors and everything as one of Wendell Scott's red number 30. You always think of him in the blue car, but he did run a red one for some events. And that's the one Ray Alfala is running here tonight. And isn't it a great looking car? Wendell Scott Foundation, a proud partner of Ray Alfalo's team. And you know there's nothing more he'd want to do than get that car into victory lane. And last time around, he was the fastest car on the track, and he's starting to pick up time on Kenny Humpy. Humpy, though, however, has led the first 20 lap, 19 laps of this event. We'll come to lap number 20 when we hit the start-finish line. And the team member is really going to be the car to beat here tonight. And you know Ray Alfala wants it. The question is, does he have enough to take to make it happen? Long way still to go. And of note, if you're an Alex Warren fan, he just bounced it off the safety barrier, one of many Darlington's tripes already here tonight. Next car further back that has one of these vintage-type paint schemes. You mentioned them already, Joe. The 05 of Nick Ottinger, honoring his great uncle, L.D. Ottinger, the former Bush Series, now Xfinity Series standout back in the 80s and early 90s. That's where that scheme came from. The old Detroit gasket car that he ran so successfully for many, many years. And just behind him, the 34, Matt Busa. That one might look familiar, Joe, to a lot of more recent race fans. That's modeled precisely after the Kevin Harvick scheme that he won with at Atlanta, just three races after Dale Earnhardt left this world. That, that is absolutely right, and I totally forgotten about that one. Thank you for reminding me of that. It, it, it wasn't a, it, it, he didn't inherit that ride under great circumstances. 
Yeah, but you see what he's able, been able to do with it. And you see what he's been able to do with the opportunity. And sometimes that is half the uh, the battle here in the in in racing is having the opportunity to show what you have. And you know, several years later in a championship, I'd say he did all right for himself. Certainly has another car a couple further back. The 39 of Michael J. Johnson. That car model after one of his very first rides in the NASCAR Peak Antifreeze Series. So not quite as familiar of a throwback, but it is one nonetheless. Casey Tucker sporting a little bit of a vintage-inspired paint scheme on the 28 car. And you go a little further back, we mentioned the Wendell Scott automobiles. Well, the 33 of Brian Blackford, it's modeled after the more traditionally thought of Wendell Scott car. The blue one with the number 34 on the side. Also partner with the Wendell Scott Foundation is Brian Blackford in Slip Angle Motorsports. You see Blackford running in the 16th spot in that paint scheme. Very vintage, very classic look. And look just behind him, Joe. That car has had such a history here at Darlington as we have a battle for second now. P.J. Sturgis all over Corey Vincent. Or check that. That's actually uh, Kenny Humpy now has Corey Vincent all over his back bumper. We'll keep an eye on that really quick. But Kevin King as well, sporting that vintage Ricky Craven paint scheme that won here in the closest finish in NASCAR history against Kurt Busch. What was that, a decade ago now? Uh, plus or minus. We'll say it was a decade, plus or minus. As you take a look at the 29 machine here, uh, on the, we're riding around on the track in just a moment. I'm sure we get our cameras around that. Meanwhile, back around the track, lots of battles starting to brew. As we mentioned a moment ago, Kenny Humphrey, Corey Vincent, first and second. Ray Alpala, PJ Sturgis, third and fourth. Brad Davies and Justin Bolton now starting to come together for position number five. And now a battle for position number seven that's going to be ended very, very quickly as Cody Bias gets around. Alan Bowes, Tyler Hudson on an island by himself. Tony, this is starting to almost look like a, a super speedway race where you have uh, packs of two battling amongst themselves for position. In a way it is, Joe, but in a way it's not. Why do I say that? I've been looking at the stopwatch and for, quote, to quote our opener and, and the honorable Ned Jarrett looking at the unofficial stopwatch. I always love to use that line on the, uh, the broadcast, but nonetheless, looking at the scoring and looking at the quote unofficial stopwatch, Kenny Humpy has been slowing down relatively speaking. Drivers like Real Fallon and others have been picking it up. I know what you're thinking. Wait, what? Yeah, this is all part of that dynamic track model, Joe. You can set your car up to be faster on a more rubbered up racetrack and try to keep up with the racetrack over the course of the day, or you can simply let it go as it is and then whatever happens, happens. But as this racetrack changes, these teams and drivers are going to have to stay on top of it, Joe. And we're going to see a lot of comers and goers, I think, especially these next couple of races this season because of the fact that they have yet to get a 100% full grasp on what their cars will do at the end of a 250 or 300 mile race. Well, when you consider how this dynamic track is going to change everything, you're absolutely right. It's going to change how uh, drivers and how teams uh, prepare for the race, for different tracks, because the track will come, will change throughout the entire series of the race. So this new update that iRacing has finally thrown, has finally thrown out to these drivers, it's going to create a new level of challenge and a new level of reality for this uh, for for each of the drivers out here. So again, it's something very fun to watch. And just as quickly as Corey Vincent has reeled in Kenny Humpy, it's almost like Kenny Humpy has picked up an extra gear or something here, Joe. Uh, car doesn't seem to be quite as stable as we've seen in races past, but he's still fast enough to stay out in front of the field. And it makes me wonder if now, maybe with this dynamic track surface model, if you can in fact conserve more tire than maybe you could before and use that bigger advantage. These are all question marks we're having to answer, but very intriguing to see how this is all playing out. As we ride in car with the 58 of Kenny Humpy, who has led all 31 laps here on the track 
Now, there's a lot of unanswered questions that we're going to get answered tonight as a result of this first uh, official NASCAR PBA Free Series powered by iRacing Race on the new uh, track style at Darlington. And Tony, frankly, this couldn't come at a better time for all these drivers. You have a new track, a new model, uh, at a very difficult track that really equalizes the field a little bit. Everyone comes in with the same exact handicap. They don't know how the track is going to affect everybody out there. And thus, it really is anybody's race, despite the fact that Kenny Humphrey has controlled the first 31 laps of this race. Exactly right, Joe. And I think this works out well, too, because I know one thing iRacing worries about. These teams, these drivers put in a lot of hours, a lot of manpower, and a lot of effort into getting these cars right, getting these setups dialed in. And the way the championship is playing out, yes, this is a great feature they've added to the service, but I think it's something that they had been very reluctant to do until a championship is either not going to be decided by it or is already decided by it. And basically, we're at that point. Kenny Humphy, I think we figured three weeks ago, had to gain about, what was it, 35 points, roughly, assuming that Ray Alfala got maximum points at every race. If the race ended as they run, guess what? It's a no-brainer. Kenny Humphy clinches a series championship. So, uh... I think this is very well timed by iRacing as well. It's not going to affect any of the major championship battles, and it basically gives these guys a chance to test who are solidified in the top 25 for the course of 2016. One, thing, one other thing to keep in mind now is the 35 laps into the run, Joe. This track, the leaders have already fallen off nearly two seconds a lap. Let that settle in. Two seconds a lap from what their fastest lap of the race was. So not only are the tires degrading, the racetrack is changing. And I, again, Joe, I wonder, will this new dynamic surface model lend this, this league, this series, to a little more conservative driving to keep those tires under you over the course of a longer run? When that track rubbers up, it's not as grueling on the tires. Or what exactly is going to happen? But very, very significant tire wear. Just 36 laps in, Joe. Two seconds a lap slower. That might account for a lot of the juking and jiving and sideways driving we've been seeing. Well, it also accounts for some of the more some of the battles we're starting to see on these on this track. And we're also starting to account for some of the pit strategy we're going to see out here on the track, including the 29 of Kevin King, who's now riding around the apron. And I believe he's going to, no, I take it back, he just came off pit road last time by. So Kevin King's starting the early uh, pit strategy. Now we've got another guy coming down pit road that's Alex Scribner is going to try to come and try his luck on pit road early. So a lot of guys are really starting to, to figure out what this new dynamic model means and ultimately how it's going to affect them as they continue to run this race. It's not the same race they've run a long time ago. Another driver on the track on the down pit road, Brandon Schmidt. Schmidt is down. And back to Alex Scribner's car, Joe. As you're watching the leaders, check out the, uh, number one, check out Kevin King on fresh tires, Superman. But uh, check out that 50 car, Alex Scribner, that was on pit road a second ago. Vintage Rusty Wallace colors on the number 50 machine. Takes you back to the mid-90s when the black and gold deuce was the king of the racetrack almost everywhere in the country. And also, Mike Conti is out there with the Terry Labonte vintage paint scheme back when he won a championship. The old Kellogg's Corn Flakes inspired scheme. And a lot of drivers really crying for tires at this point, Joe. We've seen a lot of varying pit strategies of guys coming down pit road. Taylor Hurst now having problems as well. It looks like uh, he finally makes it to his stall, but very, very different. The dichotomy we're seeing on strategies and tire management. Nowhere else have we seen 40 laps be the end of what guys can do on tires. No, I, I don't think so. And if it is, that if that is the case, then we're going to have a very, very long race in front of us, uh, Tony, just simply because these guys have been coming down pit road multiple times tonight with the sole intention of getting tires in, full, in a full load of fuel in this machine. The Z86 event Burmeister will come in this time around. That's a to Kenny Humphrey now has to deal with some lap traffic in front of him. Brandon Bowie, Alex Warren in front of him. Ryan Lowe also in his crosshairs as well. Great news for Corey Vincent, who's now cut that gap between them and is maybe about a car length, maybe two, between those two cars. It may be that, Joe, but the speed just 
Dean to drop off. We see Humpy sideways and fighting for grip, missing forward drive, just wrestling this monster around the high banks here at Darlington Raceway. It just brings you back to the old fashioned type of racing you can see at Darlington where cars were slipping, sliding, completely out of control. And again, more cars on pit road as they cannot handle this car being as out of control as they have been. And Joe, I speak. I think back to the comment the one driver made this week about how after 10 or 15 laps of this new dynamic track model, he just simply could not hold on to the race car. And it makes me wonder if these drivers that have either real life racing experience or have ties to uh, real life type data on these race cars on their teams, if they will not be the ones that excel at least the first few weeks of this because those people know what a racetrack generally is going to do, how they're going to have to set a car up to try to affect it, uh, and a lot of those other variables that still are in play. You can practice as much as you want, Joe, but there's no substitute for running 250 miles with 43 cars on a mile and a third racetrack like Darling. I'm going to agree with your statement right there. As we saw Kenny Humby get passed by almost lapped car Alex, I'm sorry, check that, uh, that's the 24 machine of Nathan Wise. Nathan Wise is a tear right now, and he's going to stay on the lead lap by getting around the 58 of Kenny Humby. You've got a point there that, yes, someone who has track time and has track experience, they're going to have an advantage under this model because they will be able to react accordingly as this track changes. But that now being said, when you have so much wisdom we have so much knowledge uh, in, in brain trust like the team or you have brain trust like um like slipping motorsports uh, there's so much knowledge about this simulation and everything it does and doesn't do uh, that there's a, a bit of i'm sure i've got a feeling there's a bit of a uh, a how do you want to call it a uh equalizer if you will as kenny humpy now gets ready to come down pit road getting sideways not wow. a good look for the points leader Missed pit road nearly to Kenny Humpy. Came in a little too early. Nick Ottinger got by in the number oh, I almost said the number two. Or check that was Ray Alfala. They got me all confused with you paint scheme. Ray Alfala got by in the number two. So he'll pick up a spot or two on Kenny Humpy. That's good for Ray Alfala's very slim championship hopes. But looking at the laps, Joe, I'm wondering if uh, Humpy and others are not trying to stretch this race to run about... 45 to 46 lap segments. If you're able to do that, you should be able to make it on three stops. I think that's the strategy Humpy's on. I believe that's the strategy that most of the front runners are on. Matt Busa is in as well on his number 34. Ray Alfala down and away on his four. Service is now complete, and he'll get a huge advantage. Now, the next thing that's going to happen, Joe, we're going to see all these drivers who pitted for fresh tires cycle back around and more than likely be ahead of the leaders once they all cycle around. Question is, how much further ahead and how much slower will they be once the cycle's around? Comers, goers, lots of pit strategy. We are not gonna know how this race is gonna play out until we get down to the very end tonight. Absolutely not as you watch the 57 machine in the box pit and that is PJ Sturgis. He will get down on pit road cleanly. And that is a big wild card right here. That is a $64,000 question is what's going to happen when old meets new. It's something we talked about earlier uh, in the season when guys talk about uh, and manage different pit strategies. But the thing is, the thing that excites me the most about this is that now it really means something. Now it really has a huge effect on the cars and on the drivers. And, you know, it, this is a situation where they're going to now have a chance to really show what their strategies can do as they make it around this very odd shape that's egg-shaped going the track. And again, Joe, remember, just because the car can't hang on the first stint doesn't mean it won't hang on better the second, third, fourth stint on older tires. We don't know. This dynamic track, my look already at these corners. When we started, it was almost the same color as asphalt. Already, the track is getting blacker and blacker, almost like the old days when it was covered in bear grease and it earned the name the Lady in Black. But this track is rubbering up, it's changing. These teams and drivers are having to stay ahead of it to keep their adjustments on point to stay as the fastest horse in this town. So far, Kenny, or excuse me, Corey Vincent is the quote unquote fastest horse in town. But look already through the running order. Kenny Humpy, who led the first, what, 40 some laps, being scored 12th. Ray Alfala, 
being scored eighth. Now, mind you, people are having to cycle around and do different things, but it's amazing how already this dynamic track model has shuffled the field in just one round of shots. Oh, Tyler Hudson might be the fastest of those guys right now as you see him just starting to shuffle through the field. In fact, I believe he might have just passed the Tana Corey Vincent for position as well as a well as a handful of other drivers. So if if I understood that and saw that correctly, Tyler Hudson, the 2013 champion, he's gonna be your new leader once we go once we get everything cycled back around. We talk a lot about this dynamic track model. Well it's not too late for you to jump in on the fun as well if you want to take your hand at this brand new track model as well. If you want to jump in, we've got a great deal for you. Go to iRacing.com. Use our promo code you see there on the screen, at the bottom of the screen, 2015-PSRTV. If you buy one month, we'll give you two months free and throw in the super late model as well so you can get started enjoying yourself all of this dynamic, new dynamic track model that iRacing has just introduced to the public. New subscribers only. Go to PSR, or, I'm sorry, iRacing.com. Use our promo code 2015-PSRTV. Buy one season, get two free, and we'll throw in the super late model as well. Now, that is the late model stock, Joe. You had me excited for a second there for the super late model, but that is the late model stock car. A little bit different, though. A little bit further back in the field as, uh, well, actually way further back in the field. We're looking around Landon Harrison in the number 89 machine. Huge, huge gaggle of cars, and, well, he's 11 seconds back of the leader, basically, is where he's at. But huge group in front of him. All those drivers are on sticker or relatively newer tires than Harrison, so they're going to be one, two, maybe even three seconds quicker. And Joe, this is where the problems come in here at Darlington. The closing rate, the speed disparagement, or the uh, speed, the discrepancy in speed, that's where you have problems. That's where you have guys running into one another, misjudging, accidents occur, and really this is a very, very hairy time as Alex Scribner catches a piece of the safer barrier off the Yeah, that's Part of the problem here, darling, I mean, not, again, not a bad thing. What you're seeing here is a lot of very fun driving, very exciting driving among all of these drivers. But again, with this new track model, with everything changing just a little bit, all of these drivers now are going to be fighting for position, and they're going to be changing, figuring out how they want to drive their race, how they want to run their personal race. Corey Vincent is still your leader, despite being passed by a... Uh, by Tyler Hudson just a few minutes ago, so Tyler Hudson did not inherit the lead. Now uh, the number 10 of Corey Vincent is being passed by everyone who has fresher tires, and as of last time around, 11 cars remain on the lead lap, with DJ Sturgis being the last of those currently scored on the lead lap. Nick Andrews is going to round 10 for Corey Vincent this time by. He'll get back on the lead lap, and right behind him is going to be the 8 of Adam Gill, and he's going to jump on there as well. Yeah, Gillen, I think, is kind of crushing the can a little bit, though, on the right side. He's got a drawing to the stripe on his number eight. And yes, you can imagine who that one is inspired from, a previous number eight car, the very similar paint scheme a few years ago. A little bit further back in the, in the running order, Tyler Hudson falling back. There's Real Fallon motors around, so there's Justin Bolton. Hudson, uh, to the best of my recollection, has not been on pit road in his number 01. I'd have to double check that to be sure. He's looking at the lap times, he probably has been, and we simply missed it. But uh, again, Joe, look at this. Vincent has not been on pit road. Former leader Kenny Humpy is only 18 seconds behind him. So if Vincent comes down pit road, there is a good chance he will end up very close to the lap down. But here's the kicker. He'll have sticker tires, and he will then be a second quicker or more than Kenny Humpy. So it's a back and forth seesaw battle all throughout the night, closing in on the completion of lap number 59, nearly lap 60, about one third distance into this one. I'm starting to wonder if Corey Vincent is not running a two stop strategy trying to cut this race in thirds. Uh, I, I would say so. I believe that Corey Vincent is going to try to make this on two stops. He already has seen everyone else come in at different uh, junctures in this race. He's already seen everybody else kind of play their hand, if you will. Uh, now, not even 
uh, halfway into this race. So Corey Vincent now has a little bit of an advantage on his side. He knows what he can do mileage-wise on this car, but the tires are going to be the 64,000 R question. Will his tires be able to hold out for him to make a two-tire stop? Now, if we have a caution flag somewhere in this race, if the caution flag comes out, his strategy is moot because then everybody's going to come down pit road and effectively the race will be reset. Well, effectively, Joe, but not really. I mean, it's a matter of where everything falls in, a matter of track position, a matter of simple strategy. And it looks like he is going to be coming down pit road this time with Corey Vincent. And that will split this race perfectly into thirds at the conclusion of lap number 61. Landon Harrison on the same strategy. And that will be Ray Alfala will inherit the lead in the Wendell Scott Foundation Ford. As he will cross the stripe, Alfala gets credit for leading. Lap number 61, so Alfala to the point, Justin Bolton out to second, Hudson third, Kenny Humpy and Cody Bias are now the top five, and just as we said, Joe, the way these new tires, the way this new surface model is played out, this race is completely unpredictable. We might have our guesses, we might have our hunches, but really, until the checkered flag falls, we have no clue how this one's going to play out. Absolutely not. As you see Corey Benson there come into attention for his crew. It'll be a four-tire stop, full tank of virtual Sunoco fuel on that pen machine down and away. Corey Benson gets back on the racing surface. Excellent stop for the 10 team. You're absolutely right. Nothing, nothing ends until everything ends. And as Yogi Berra once said, Yo, it ain't over till it's over. Now problems with the 82. Alex Warren acted like he was coming down pit road and Kenny Humpy just plowed into the TV panel of that car. And look at the nose of the peak Chevrolet of Kenny Humpy. 64 laps into this one and Kenny Humpy has got the first real problem he has had all season long. That car more than likely is going to pick up a nasty push because he has mangled the front of his Chevrolet SS. And I'm thinking he's putting that peak radiator guarantee to the test because somehow that thing is still running and has not overheated yet. But uh, Kenny Humpy certainly not in the plans to run the back of Alex Warren and has now certainly put a wild card into this one. A wild card, yes, but maybe not overall because remember, Kenny Humpy uh, had an opportunity to watch it to come in there. I. It, Kenny Humpy didn't have the opportunity to see him down there, um, so I'm not sure. It just means that Kenny Humpy may be a one week away from uh, not getting, not catching a ten thousand dollar check. Nonetheless, Humpy's still running down there, and I'm very curious what he's going to do when he comes down pit road. No caution flag on that incident, despite two count them two very specific incidents. One involving Kenny Humpy, one involving Alex Warren. Uh, or Alex Warren involving both of them, I should say. And nonetheless, it's very curious that they would not throw a caution flag for that incident. Keep in mind, Joe, for Kenny Humpy to have this championship in the bag, he needs to leave Garlington with a 96-point lead or greater. He could then completely skip the last two races because he will have the, beneficiary, the benefit of winning more races than Ray Alfala. So, yeah, it's not going to be impossible to leave here not cashing the championship check, but more or less, it's going to be a done deal. Remember, as we said earlier, he had to gain, what was it, 35 points total over the course of the night to end up with enough points to lock himself into a championship. As the race runs, yeah, he's losing some ground to Tyler Hudson, to Ray Alfala, and others, but... If this race continues as it is, I have a feeling Humpy will still somehow find a way to power through this and end up in a championship contending spot where maybe, just maybe, he can walk to the bank and there we go. That changes everything. Caution on the speedway. Brandon Schmidt and Benjamin Burmeister have come to blows over in turns three and four. And uh, it all started with Brandon Schmidt getting out of shape and poor Brad Mahar, his second incident of the night, got into Benjamin Burmeister and that brings us under yellow with 67 laps complete. And now, Joe, this, again, this has completely changed because nobody's going to take the wave around. I almost guarantee you that. And everybody's going to come down pit road screaming for tires. 
Let's start with the two of Ray Alfala, who's going to come down pit road, and he might be the first one to come down pit road uh, front of, in front of everybody else. Yeah, he is way out there, and Ray Alfala will be the first one now to the attention of his crew. Justin Bolton, Tyler Hudson, Kenny Humpy, all to the attention of their crew. Brad Davies now down on pit road, the 57 machine. That's P.J. Sturgis. He's going to be the time to the attention of his crew. Michael J. Johnson, Chris Overland are next. Matt Busa, Casey Tucker, Michael Connie, Brian Blackford. I've got a few Feeling, Tony, they're going to have to come down Pitt Road just to sort out where everybody is on the track. That they will, Joe. The big losers on this one, the number 10 of Corey Vincent is the big loser. Same with Landon Harrison. They have been trapped a lap down. They may elect to take the wave around, or they may come back in for tires and fuel. We'll see how it all plays out. Ray Alfala easily going to win the race off of the pit lane. Second off will be the number 36 of Mike or Michael Bolton of Justin Bolton. Then comes Hudson, Davies, P.J. Sturgis, Kenny Humpy's team tending to the nose piece of his peak Chevrolet, trying to get the ductwork all back in place. They do not have to test that peak radiator guarantee and many others coming off pit road after four tires and a full tank of virtual Sunoco racing fuel. We'll reset the running order and come back in just a little bit. You're watching the Peak Southern 250 live from the Darlington Raceway, live on PSR TV. Don't go away. Guys, I never would have thought making duck calls would have stirred up this much excitement. No kidding. You got them coming up here. Shortcut time! Woo! 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 Ah. You sure this is a good idea? Oh, yeah. I got this. I can't guarantee you how this will end, but Pete can guarantee your radiator for life. Introducing the Peak Run True Guarantee. Check it out at peakguarantee.com. Welcome back to the Lady in Black, and she has put her dancing shoes on for round number two here tonight, first caution flag of the evening. Getting ready to be rescinded from the flag stand, Ray Alfala, Justin Bolton, Tyler Hudson, Brad Davis, and are the top five. A lot of stories after that caution flag flew, one of which championship contender and leader, Danny Humpy, is back in the first spot. Alfala off turn number four. Will take the green flag and jump to a huge lead on the get-go. Behind him, Joe, they are side by side for a second. They get it quickly sorted out before they get to turn number one, as does the rest of the field. Very hurriedly, side by side, dwindles down to single file as they work their way off turn number two and down the back straightaway. Hudson looking a bolt, but nothing there. Last thing you want to do is call, bring another caution out. As we've talked about all throughout the season, yellows beset yellows. And the last thing you want is a whole spree of calm of yellow fever on the track, which is why everybody is running conservatively, everyone's running single file. And despite that short little battle between Tyler Hudson and Justin Bolton for position number two, really everyone here running very single file, very clean around this track. Very smart by drivers, if I say so myself. Well, Joe, every 
veteran of racing will tell you the key to winning at Darlington is not to race the competition, but simply to race the racetrack. If you do that and make it to the end, then you might have a shot at success here at the Old Lady. And there's a reason this track has earned the nickname. I can stress the burn. Too tough to tame. Very unique geometry on both ends of the racetrack. Very, very narrow racing line. It rewards veterans. It rewards patient drivers. It rewards drivers who can roll with the punches, so to speak. Whether that's running the back of somebody like Kenny Humphy did and trying to make up ground from there. Whether it's simply trying to hit your mark lap after lap after lap like Ray Alfala has been doing. Darlington is a very temperamental woman. Kind of like most women, for that matter, to be honest with you. But nonetheless, very temperamental, very much an old school style racetrack where it's difficult to get around and you've got to be perfect in order to be there at the end. You have to be better than perfect. You have to be on point all race long. You cannot have a, a lots of concentration at all around this track. You have to be able to concentrate all one or three laps. Otherwise, you know, you're not going to be in a good place at the end of the race. A couple of housekeeping notes if you're a Brandon Schmidt fan. Black flag on number three for passing before the start finish line. He'll come down pit road to serve the penalty. And Brad Mahar's car has been emitting a bunch of smoke the last few laps, running around the apron at a very reduced speed. So his Toyota is not long in this world either as we continue on here at Darlington. One driver I want to call a little bit of attention to here tonight who's having a stellar run compared to where his season has been so far. The 39 of Michael J. Johnson started in sixth. He has been in the top ten all night long with that throwback to his original iRacing Peak Anna Free Series paint scheme. Having a solid run. He's even got the onboard camera with us tonight. And always good to see these guys have encouraging runs like this. Of course, Johnson, uh, very, very uh, been research the uh, involved with the Gale Force. And uh, they've had some fun whenever they've been out uh, doing some karting events and things like that. And pretty good wheel in the real world. And looks like now we've added these extra realistic options. To, well, not even options, extra realistic features to iRacing. The, uh, the real drivers seem to come out. One driver is going to have a lot of problems for the rest of this race with Brad Mahar. You have to remember, he was involved in that very first incident tonight where he backed into the safer barrier on the inside wall. Heavy smoke started pouring out of that 13 machine about a lap ago, and now he's on pit road doing everything he can to try to get that car back on the track. I don't think it's going to happen. I think Mahar's day is done. Looking at Chris Overland and the 57 of P.J. Sturgis. That battle starting to tense up just a little bit. In fact, in the middle of that, too, is the uh, 28 of Casey Tucker. Uh, we'll check that. Uh, Casey Tucker is not in the middle of that battle. Probably saw him up there, but did not. But it is Overland, and who else is back there behind him? Brandon Schmidt, who just came off pit road after serving that penalty. Now, here's a very good indication, if you're a Brandon Schmidt, Joe, up to how good your race car is. You're up here with the leaders. Can you keep up with them? If so, it's encouraging because it tells you to get the track position, you've got a fast race car. The problem is, Brandon Schmidt, you're mired now back in 30-second spot being shown two laps down. Area spot, but we've seen earlier that all they need to do is have the right set of circumstances come his way, and he can go two laps back very easily here in Darlington. As now he had problems with the car number 33, that's Brian Blackbird. He's going to start going backwards. He had to grab a couple of handfuls of steering wheel like Wendell Scott used to do to manhandle his machines and still have solid, solid runs each and every week on the uh, almost in the Grand National Series two tour. So Brian Blackbird channeling a little bit of his inner Wendell Scott to make that happen. And continues on in the number 33 so a lot of that we keep seeing joe our, our spotters just so everybody watching knows we've got a team of spotters that we see what we can see but we've only got a pair of eyes apiece we've got a team of spotters that are watching everything around the racetrack well in an average race we get a good dozen 15 oh look at this oh look at that oh this happened okay great we process it we see if it's you know worthy of mentioning and go on from there Tonight already, I think we've had about 50 screams in our ears from our spotters go, oh, this guy's sideways. Oh, that guy's in the wall. Oh, oh, he almost lost it. This is vintage Darlington, is it not? 
This is what the people pay to see every year at Darlington, and they are not disappointing. This new track model really starting to pay off, if not for the drivers, then for the audience at home who gets a real show of how Darlington is run year after year here in iRacing. So the cut cap up, if I can talk, that would help. To uh, recap everything up front as we're slowly closing in on the halfway point. Lap number 92 is only about the eight circuits away. Ray Alfalla continues to lead by about a second over Justin Bolton, Tyler Hudson, Brad Davies, and P.J. Sturgis. And looking at the uh, Terry Labonte throwback scheme, that is Michael Conti in a peak antifreeze-sponsored entry. You'd never guess it, would you? But he's got the blue depth on the hood, the peak antifreeze down the side. Whoever did that design did a fantastic job, Joe. They integrated the same type of fonts. They integrated the same look on everything. Uh, for being a completely non-serial-based sponsor, uh, I must say that is a very, very well-done piece. And props to Peak as well for letting some of these artists that design these cars have some freedom like they did with Michael Conti's machine. Well, it's no secret that a lot of painters use the iRacing sim to kind of get a feel and look of how a car is going to look when it actually goes to the track. And correct me if I'm wrong, but there's been a lot of painters who have started in iRacing or started in another uh, simulation uh, that have all gone on to actually paint real cars for some of the real drivers. Kevin King, the driver of the number 29 machine, correct me if I'm wrong, but he's one of them. He is one of them, Joe. He's painted cars for Kevin Harvick and Dale Earnhardt Jr. in the past. There are some others, like J.D. Laird, who has done the same thing. And Laird paints a lot of the cars in the NASCAR Canterbury series. You might have recognized J.D. Laird. Um, some guy named Dale Earnhardt Jr. ran one of his cars a couple years ago with the Mountain View Camp sponsorship. So, um, you know, you might have heard of it. You might have seen it. But, no, Joe, there are a lot of teams and drivers and painters that – find inspiration on the iRacing sim. And that's one thing I love about the iRacing community. It's just like the real racing community in that there are specialists, so to speak, in everything. Whether that's a media type specialist who works on the PR side, the video side, the, the design specialist who worry about hero cards and painting cars and designs. And whoa, watch out, hello. One car up on the outside wall, that was the number 37 car who nearly got clobbered of Steven Gilbert, but everybody got around without any major incident. But there are just so many specialists, Joe, and we talk about that. There's crew chief specialists and spotters and drivers, and it really is a microcosm of the motorsports industry as a whole. And uh, certainly props to everybody here for doing their due diligence on whatever their specialty is. Now problems between the 36 and the 32 machine, and that will bring the caution flag out once again. Justin Bolton got into the, let's say the 32 machine uh, coming through there, and that's going to come into the turn, and that's going to bring out the second caution flag of the evening. And, Joe, that is a product of the discrepancy and the disparagement between times that we have talked about earlier. Danny Hansen with a second and a half slower per lap than was Justin Bolton. Bolton didn't really try to take him out, just that much more grip, and Bolton could not get it wove down in very treacherous turn number two bring out the second caution flag of the evening here at the Lady in Black. And again, this will throw everybody's strategies into a loop as we are at the halfway point. Those drivers who are making it 45 laps, Joe, if we stay green, can make it on one stop from here. But everybody has to pit at least once, including this stop. So we'll see how it all plays out. Al is going to lead him down. Bolton, with maybe some minor damage in the nose of his machine, will come into the pits as well. So will Hudson and everyone else. Wholesale pit stops. It's feeding time at the zoo. Still a two-stop race, but let's see if we can get one of those knocked out here as Ray Alpala will lead the entire, or most of the field, I should say, down to the attention of their pit crews. You see the zero one of Tyler Hudson ducking in. Justin Bolton will duck into his stall, and there goes the two of Alfala. No surprise to hear of what he's looking for. Should be two, four tires and a full tank of fuel. The right sides go up on that machine. The left sides will go up accordingly. The, the four tires will go on that two machine, and they'll be down and away. The question is, who's going to win the race off of pit road? It should be the two, but stranger things have happened. The Alfala will be off first, and it'll be the zero one of Tyler Hudson nosing out the 36 of Justin Bolton for position number three. And a whole bunch 
of other drivers spill out onto the racetrack from the confines of pit road afterwards and we'll get it all sorted out here in just a little bit of note kenny humpy the championship leader still on pit road fixing the nose damage that he incurred two runs ago when he ran smack dab into the back of alex warren on the back straightaway so it looks like kenny humpy's night this is the big hiccup but he had such a comfortable point lead coming into this evening it really should not affect the championship one iota to be 100% completely honest with you as the pace car works its way off turn number four. And that means we'll take another quick break here from the Darlington Raceway. You're watching the Peak Southern 250 from the Lady in Black. We'll be right back. Sorry guys, I never would have thought making duck calls would have stirred up this much excitement. No oh, kidding. You got him coming up here. Shortcut time! Woo! Yeah. That's what I'm talking about! Ah. You sure this is a good idea? Oh yeah, I got this. I can't guarantee you how this will end, but Pete can guarantee your radiator for life. Introducing the Peak Run True Guarantee. Check it out at peakguarantee.com. Listen to that sound. Look at the sight of nearly 43 NASCAR Buchanan Free Series cars circling around the Darlington Raceway for nearly a full lap at song. Sticker tires make you feel like Superman, Joe. Look at everybody making moves, darting around, jockeying for position, trying to move their way forward while the hitting is good here at Darlington. But up front is still Ray Alfala over Tyler Hudson, and 57 of P.J. Sturgis. Oh, over break, one thing we were mentioning, we were talking about the difference as these tires fall off, Joe. The difference as the laps wind down between the surface, how it is changing, how the race car's handling is changed from each of these machines because of that dynamic surface model, because the new tire model, the fall off of the tires themselves. This is back to the way racing always was at Darlington. You weren't stuck to the ground, you weren't in a single file train. You had a huge discrepancy and literally laps more on your tires could be spell disaster and two or three laps less could spell success it really really was a three four five six second drop off in lap times because this place was so abrasive and so greasy you're absolutely right again you're seeing the dynamic track now at work 
If you didn't understand why this dynamic track was such a big deal for iRacing, you are physically seeing it now in front of you as the track changes, as the cars change, and you're really starting to see what this sport can become. Earlier, Tony, you talked about everyone having a specialty, having a job on this crew that goes beyond setting up the car and driving it. You're really seeing the next evolution of this sport here with this new uh, change because now it goes beyond, okay, I can set up a car, it now goes into, now that I set up the car, what do I do with it as we continue to run? Uh, and it really puts a lot of guesswork into it, Joe, because if you have a race, let's say, with 10 cars, the track will not change as much as, say, a race with 40 cars. So you can test as much as you want. You can get as much of a data set as you want, but you really don't know 100% how the race is going to play out until you're on the racetrack. So it keeps you guessing. There's no more, all right, I put this setup in, I run the same setup all race long and win. Yay. No. As the race goes on, you're going to have to tweak the track bar. You're going to have to add some wedge. You're going to have to make the tire pressure adjustment. You've got to do things to keep up with the racetrack. And that, I think, is what excites most of the teams and drivers and almost everybody on the service so much is the fact that now it's no longer your quote-unquote video game. It's not one thing. It's problems for Nathan Wise in the 24. He catches a piece of the safer barrier. And I think Nick Ottinger caught a piece of it, too, in the Reen Camry. But, Joe, there are so many variables now that you cannot control them. You can only guess at so many, and the rest really make this race that much more unpredictable, and it has to be that much more fun for a driver and a team to compete. Well, it also, it also just shows you the, the evolution of this uh, simulation and where it's going. For years, we've talked about uh, the iRacing sim. we talked about uh, this particular sim and sims like it being a training tool for these drivers with this new addition. This goes beyond just being a training tool. This goes beyond being a video game, as these things have been called over the years. Now this is really turning into the next uh, position for the sport to be in. This is really turning into what the, what the, the car could be, what the, the sport could be. And you really can see with this addition, you can see the next generation of iRacing coming through the NASCAR Peak Antifree Series to get to a real car. Well, Joe, in my mind, there's no question. I was at the IMCA Speedway Motor Super Nationals fueled by Casey this past week. And one of the things of conversation that came up were the quote-unquote video game kids. There are so many youngsters coming into motorsports now, and so many of them are so good. And a lot of people wonder, how are they so good? How are they so fast so quickly? And one of the hypotheses that's been floated is just this. They get on iRacing. And even before the dynamic surface model, they were able to pick up tracks, pick up cars, and find the fast way around a racetrack just like that. So they take that to a real car and acquire that same skill. Now you add in this dynamic surface model, new tire model again for this build, and so many things, Joe, it just enhances that sense of what it takes to be fast, of teaching drivers how to adapt, and it really is becoming more and more of a training tool where guys can jump in any sort of race car and be fast right off the get-go. You, you, you've got a great point there as we watch a 33 of Brian Blackford and a five of uh, Michael Connie, last season's champion, uh, start to get close there. And that's gonna be four position number 10. Our uh, guys trying to break in further in the top 10 is Michael Connie, currently 10th, the 33 of Blackford, ninth, and Casey Tucker currently sitting in eighth. Your leader, Ray Alfala, continues to dominate this field. Tyler Hudson, Phoebe Sturgis, Justin Bolton, and Chris Overland, your top five. As to your point, though, uh, Tony, to what you were saying just a few minutes ago, I think you definitely got some there. And I think what this really offers is an opportunity for drivers and up and coming drivers to uh, get the feel of a car, understand what a car is going to do, and how it's going to adjust without actually having to spend millions of dollars that are involved starting your own cup team from building the car in the first place to fueling it every week to getting it somewhere. Uh, you know, you want to talk about specialists or God knows how many in any given NASCAR garage dedicated just to making the car work every week. And so this offers an excellent opportunity for these drivers to not only get that valuable seat time that will serve them well in the future, but do it at a very, very cost-effective method. Very true, Joe. By the way, if you're a Brad Davies fan, he just wrinkled up the car a little bit off turn number two, caught a piece of the safer barrier, and that's allowed Jake Sturgis to close in on the back of number 11, and 
Something else has come into play here tonight as well, Joe. New debris model is essentially been being worked on in iRacing to where it used to be you could run over certain things in the, in the sim and it wouldn't affect you, but now you can do as much as hit a cone on iRacing and bend the splitter or knock the nose up or, or whatever. So you've got to be more and more careful. Again, more and more like an actual race car than what it ever has been before. So the skills of these teams and drivers need to be tested. And I just find it so appropriate that we throw all these new variables at everybody on probably the toughest track on the circuit at Darlington. And I must say, they have responded very, very well and very impressed overall at the quality of this field and how well they have done their homework. Well, as you meant, you know, it's something that we, we didn't mention, or we did mention a little bit, but not a whole lot. A few weeks ago, these guys ran, a lot of these guys ran here in preparation for Darlington. Now, it's a completely different track, it's a completely different driver, and it's a completely different set of fit of, of uh, variables these guys are driving with. So, again, great for competition, great for drivers, as Brandon Schmidt will come down pit road, but even better for the audience who now gets to see racing at its finest in the eSport form. Brad Davies once again catching a piece of the safer barrier. So it looks like he now chasing the racetrack is Brad Davies. Apparently a little too greasy for the number 11's taste as he is right up against that safer barrier off of turn number two again. And uh, I'd be curious, I'll, I'll admit, Joe, I hate to say this. I've been busy in Iowa the last basically two weeks doing some other things as well with uh, an ARCA driver getting prepped for a couple of races coming up. I haven't had a chance to be on iRacing in the last couple of weeks to test this new dynamic surface model, but everything I see and hear about it, this is what racing is supposed to be like. It's not easy. It's not going to be simple by any means, but it is going to challenge you. It's going to get you frustrated. It's going to get you ticked off, but it's also going to make it that much more fulfilling when you do finally master a race track. It makes it fulfilling for you and fulfilling for the for the uh, the fans as well because these guys are starting to pick up fans. They're starting. You're you're seeing guys with their own Facebook pages, their Twitter accounts. Speaking of which, if you want to engage with us on Twitter, use the hashtag #EdPass as we'll be seeing some of those tweets throughout the night at the bottom of the screen. These guys are having all of their own accoutrements that you see the regular the, the regular sprint car drivers have, and because of that, there's going to be more interest in the in the group, and more importantly to that, it creates more not real, is not reality, but more of connection between the drivers, the fans, and sport. Certainly does. Corey Vincent, uh, driver who was leading earlier, tried to make this a two-stop race, got caught with a caution flag. Well, you guys quick yellow a little bit ago, got four brand new stickers, and now he is moving back forward. He has clawed his way back to the 11th. He's in the back bumper of Casey Tucker, and a few strong horses in front of Vincent, including Tucker. The five of Conti, the 33 of Brian Blackford. And right now, Corey Vincent, one of the few drivers who's still running around the 28-9 second range. So if that trend continues, Corey Vincent very likely could be at the front of this field before it's all over, over with again. Nothing would surprise me at this point, but remember, we have at least one more yellow flag uh, to run, or not yellow flag, but one more pit stop uh, to run uh, before we get is all said and done with. So everyone's going to have to figure out how to come down pit road, when they want to come down pit road, and more importantly, what that stop is going to look like when they decide to take it. So with one more pit stop in the air, as we took a look at the 33 machine of Brian Blackford, he's trying to get around the 11 of Brad Davies, who's earned his Darlington stripe. As we look at all of these uh, these cars trying to figure out what they want to do, there's two things going on. Number one, how do you maintain the position you have as a 33 gets around the 11 for position number seven? And number two, what do I need to do when I come down pit road in order to make sure I continue my run? Benjamin Burmeister slow on the racetrack here on the front straightaway. Looks like he'll get back up to speed, at least avoiding any sort of incident. Again, Joe, we mentioned it earlier, there are spotters in our ears about every 13 seconds now going, problem here, this is wrong, that's wrong, something's happening here. And you're riding on board now with Brad Davies, number 11. He has gotten himself a handful. I think it's beat up on the right side. It looks like it's been through a 10-round title bout for a heavyweight championship, and he's only just past the halfway point, about two-thirds of the way, through this peak Southern 250 here at the Darlington Raceway. And 
Very impressed though, Davis to be able to hang on to it. Look at that thing. Sideways, out of shape, out of control. It's back the way racing should be. And that is certainly not a bad thing. This is exactly what we love about racing, why we love racing in the high racing service. 57 to PJ Sturgis, he was position number three, will maintain position number three, but that Darling Stripe started to look a little ubiquitous on the 57 machine last time around. Touched the wall, and now he's gonna, might be challenged by the 50 of Alex Scribner. That's not for position, that's for Alex Scribner to ultimately try to get back on the lead lap, and you see the 50 come down around 57. Scribner looking to get back on the lead lap, and with brand new tires underneath him, he could very easily do it. Very well could joke those tires will degrade, they will wear out, and if he couldn't make it the length of this run, there's no way he's making the lap number 183. Again, many strategies playing out. Tyler Hudson's aware of that. His team tells him, hey, Scribner's nowhere in a position to beat you. Don't beat yourself. He too lets that Camry go ahead and motor on around. So Scribner trying to find his way back to Ray Alfala and around to try to make up a lap here on the field. Speaking of PJ Sturgis, Joe. We haven't talked a lot about him all season long. He's very quietly been a, not even a championship contender. I mean, technically, yeah, he's in the top three in points in third coming in tonight. But P.J. Sturgis, this I think is a breakout season for him. In so much as he's been there every week, he's had solid runs and very, very quietly worked his way to third place in points. I mean, that's worth some cash in itself, plus some other contingency awards and prizes. But... I don't think if we'd said that to anybody at the beginning of the season, they would have believed that, even P.J. himself. So very, very impressed and very, very pleasant surprise this season for P.J. Sturgis. Cer certainly it is. And, you know, again, it just speaks to how this uh, sport is growing and how the sport is evolving and how it's changing, which are all excellent things to see as we uh, get ready to kind of wind the season down. Only two more races after this one tonight before we crown a champion and look forward towards 2016. And one of the things we have to look at, Joe, is the gap from 25th on back. Right now, that sits at two points between 25th and 26th, a tight battle right there amongst Landon Harrison and a whole host of others. And that's very important, Joe, because if you're in the top 25 at the end of the race at Homestead, you are locked in the 2016 NASCAR Pekana Free Series. You don't have to worry about provisionals or racing your way in or any of that stuff. If you're outside the top 25, as they basically call it in the uh, English Premier League, you are in the relegation zone. You are forced to run the Pro Series again if you want to keep your Pekana Free Series license. And that means anything can happen. You can have another 15 or 20 drivers become eligible then through the Pro Series for the NASCAR Pekana Free Series. And you do not want to put yourself in that position if you can avoid it. As you're right on the roof cam of the air apparent, the 57, uh, 57 I'm sorry, VJ Sturgis, uh, not the air apparent, I should say. We were at the roof cam of him. You see just how close he is to that 01 of Tyler Hudson. Going back to the actual points themselves, right now, uh, PJ Sturgis is running outside of that top 20. If uh, I am reading my latest uh, stats correctly, uh, the 20th position right now belongs to Landon Harrison, who's got a uh, handful of points over Cody Bias, who was involved in incident earlier. Tyler Hudson also in that danger zone as well, as he's currently running 22nd in points. So for those two drivers right there, this is less a uh, about. This is less. Sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting a. It's, it's like I'm in, a, I'm in the Boston Stadium, and I'm getting conflicting things in my headset. What I was trying to say is, it's all about for these drivers. It's all about trying to get that top spot, that top finish, in order to get back in the top twenty. And speaking of getting in the top of things, look at the top of the racetrack compared to the bottom here. See if Ian and the guys in the production truck can pull this off. We've been keeping an eye on this. And again, this is the new dynamic surface model. On Twitter, there's a lot of reports, drivers saying the car is being looser and looser and looser as this track rubbers up. And there you can see it. Look how dark the groove is. All that rubber has been laid down. And basically what happens is whatever side of the car is gripping better, in most drivers' cases, while they feel balanced, they run these cars in the free side. It's the fastest way around the racetrack. So your front tires have got more grip inherently than the rears. 
and as it rubbers up and rubbers up, the end of the car that has more grip to begin with will exponentially increase. Therefore, the back end is waving around, and there went T.J. Sturgis into the outside wall in turns three and four. So it becomes freer and freer and freer, and you have to keep up with it. So as it gets darker, that's something to keep an eye out for. These race cars, at least here, at least today, are getting looser and looser. Next race here, it might be completely different, Joe. It might not get that bad. It might be the opposite. We really don't know. And again, these curveballs are what make this so entertaining. And I think iRacing really nailed it with this. It's that extra element of realism so many people really wanted. It opens up so many doors for the near future of how things could be for other types of racing and, and other advancements in the sim. We'll see how all that progresses over time. But this is a huge step. Nobody has ever done this in simulation the way that they have. And again, I think they simply have aced it because you see these drivers fight this fight these race cars, fight the racetrack, and have to adapt on the fly is just amazing. You're absolutely right, Tony, and, and what, again, what this is so exciting about this, what really entertains me about this is it's now not just relegated to, to the select few. Anyone can run these tracks. Anyone who has an iRacing uh, subscription can run these tracks, can run around the, and, and get that feeling for what these drivers face week in and week out as they run the real tracks in real life. And if you want to be one of those drivers who've got a great deal for you, Go to iRacing.com if you're a new subscriber and you use our promo code 2015-PSRTV. If you buy one month, we'll give you two free as well as the stock late model, not the super late model, as Tony corrected me earlier, the stock late model. Again, for new subscribers only, 2050, if you use our promo code when you sign up for iRacing, 2015-PSRTV. If you buy one month, we'll give you two free and the stock late model car. In other words, the car more similar to the Xfinity Series and Cup Series cars. That's a whole technical difference that a lot of people get really confused on. Don't worry. I work for a series where they run late mile stocks and super late miles. Imagine trying to tell fans what the difference is when they look so similar from the outside. Yeah, it's kind of confusing. Speaking of differences, TJ Sturgis, maybe a little faster than Tyler Hudson. Maybe not. Hudson bent or pulled over <laughs> to let TJ Sturgis by. And Sturgis unable to take full advantage of that. So he'll fall back in line in the third spot. A little bit further back, Jake Sturgis running with Brian Blackford, Michael Conti, Justin Bolton all right there within range. And looks like just behind them, Blackford going to lose a spot on track to Ryan Lowe. It's not for position. It is simply track position for that matter. And already, Joe, we're seeing pit stops begin for some drivers who just couldn't take it any longer. You know, when the, when the car becomes undrivable, you have to make that very critical decision of, do I come down pit road, do I not come down pit road, and more importantly, uh, do I come down and try to risk it now for greater payoff later, knowing that this car will drop off. Corey Vincent came down pit road just a few moments ago, looking for the same thing everyone's looking for, four tires and a full tank of Sunoco Racing Fuel with Adam Gillen, now coming off pit road after taking the four tire stop, Ryan Day, to the attention of his crew, Rob Ackley, the 22 machine, will come off pit road, Danny Hanson, who's got some hood issues on that 32 machine, he will come off pit road, it looks like, this time around, as it looks like they've got to do some stuff to fix that um, that hood. The nine of Tyler Hill also going off pit road, looking for four tires and fuel, so a lot of guys now, you're right, they couldn't dig it, that's more coming off pit road. Justin Bolton, Jake Sturgis, uh, Casey Tucker, all coming to the attention of their crews this time by. David Rattler will join them as well. Nick Ottinger uh, is on the verge of coming down pit road, I thought. He's actually being shown 30 seconds in a rear of the leader, Ray Alfalab. I'm looking back at Corey Vincent, Joe, and he's the one I think to keep an eye on. He's, before the first run of the race, he ran nearly 60-some laps. We know he can hang on to it. It's not a problem as Brad Davies now peels off for service. But I think Corey Vincent is the one that's forced everybody's hand because he is just as fast as the leaders, and he might have a shot at cycling around to the lead. Speaking of cycling around to the lead, Ray Alfala relinquishes the top spot, Joe, and he now is on pit road. I think maybe some drivers realizing that short pitting is going to be the way to go because he's forcing their hand. Alfala down to the attention of the crew as Chris Overland inherits the top spot. 
So Chris Overland will get the honor of leading a couple laps here after dancing with the Lady in Black for a couple laps. So the question is how long will that last for him as more drivers call off pit road? P.J. Sturgis, Tyler Hudson, Taylor Hurst all coming off of pit road. Brian Blackford, Michael Conney will come off pit road as well. And really, it's entertaining me now. The 11 of Brad Davies is welcoming off pit road. It's entertaining me, uh, Tony, that now what was a bunch of a handful of guys coming down at their own will is now everybody coming down in sync as Ray Alfala comes off pit road after a four tire stop. Uh, he was going to be followed by Kenny Humpy, who is now as well. Benjamin Burmeister in oh, the back out again. Oh, this changes everything. And my, oh my, there are a bunch of drivers trapped a lap down. According to scoring last time, only seven drivers being scored on the lead lap. One of them, the number 10 of Corey Vincent, who has been down pit road. Ray Alfala, another one of the drivers being scored on the lead lap. Landon Harrison stayed out. He is the leader. Chris Overland was on pit road when the caution came out. So he will most likely, well, he will stay on the lead lap and most likely cycle around to be the leader. And now as everybody comes around, Joe, I'm showing four cars on the lead lap. Harrison, Overland, Nick Ottinger, and Corey Benson. There will be a ton of wave arounds on this yellow, almost guaranteed. Oh, absolutely there is. There's going to be, and there's a lot of people who are going to be, they may be hurting after those wave arounds because if they don't come down pit road and get new tires and you have a lot of guys who've already come down pit road and gotten those tires, it's going to be very literally a battle of the haves versus have-nots. And when you have the battle, guess who's going to win that one? Well, we'll have to find out, Joe, is Landon Harrison very lonely on pit road. He comes down for service, and look at that. There's nobody around at all. Like, it's literally just him going to the drive through almost in the middle of the night. That's about what it feels like, I'm sure, for Landon Harrison. Nick Ottinger, I believe, will be coming down pit road. He's got nothing to lose. Same with Corey Vincent and Chris Overland. But everybody else, Ray Alfala, P.J. Sturgis, Kenny Humphy, Justin Bolton, I suspect they will take the wave around, Joe, but here's the thing. The tires are not as fresh as those who just came down pit road, and track position is not in their favor. Some of them may only have one or two laps in the tires, so it's not a big deal. But some might have 10 or 12 laps in the tires, and it's a huge deal. So this is going to be interesting to see how it all plays out. Well, we'll shake it down and analyze it for you here in just a little bit. 142 laps are in the books, only 41 circuits to go in the NASCAR Pecan Free Series peak Southern 250. We'll be back to Darlington in just a little bit. Sorry, guys. I never would have thought making duck calls would have stirred up this much excitement. No kidding. We got them coming up here. Shortcut time! Yeah. 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 That's what I'm talking about! Ah. You sure this is a good idea? Oh, yeah. I got this. I can't guarantee you how this will end, but Peak can guarantee your radiator for life. Introducing the Peak Run True Guarantee. Check it out at peakguarantee.com. Welcome back to Darlington. Now, Joe, I want you to take a look at this. Look at this on your screen, everybody. We talked about this dynamic track and how it's changed, how the corners being blacker and blacker and built up more and more with rubber. On one side, you see lap number nine as we took this shot. Hardly any rubber on the racetrack at all. On the other side, 
about 10 laps ago. Look at the difference, Joe. It is so much darker now than it was at the beginning of the race. It's going to continue to rubber up. Just amazing how that works in. These cars, again, every driver's reporting their cars are changing. They're having to keep up with the racetrack. The setup is not staying the same. And they're really having to get up on the wheel in these things. They are facing a very a new challenge they've never faced before in these cars. They've now they're facing a challenge of having to contend with a track that is rubbering up. They're facing a a tire model that's really starting to wear, and they're facing arguably the most difficult track on the entire circuit they will face all year. And whoever's going to win this race will win it by sheer determination alone. The number 47 of Chris Overland, he will hit, drop the hammer as the green flag flies once again on lap 145. And now it's the battle for second. Landon Harrison, Corey Vincent, Ray Alfala, Nick Ottinger, all doing business for position number two. Five cars were on the lead lap before the one to go signal. Now 24 cars are on the lead lap. 19 vehicles waved around the caution car to take the free pass. Uh, or the wave around, I technically, I should say. That means they did not come down pit road. They're on older tires and less fuel. They're praying for a yellow flag to get back on sequence with the rest of the field. It could happen, but with only about 37 laps to go, they've got to get up on the wheel and dig for all it's worth. Chris over the leader over Corey Vincent, Ray Alfala, Nick Ottinger, and Landon Harrison. A lot of new players to the field. And there's the quick caution they were all hoping for. Problems with the number 50 of Alex Scribner have put us under the yellow flag once again. And sometimes prayers do come true for race car drivers, Joe. There is a prime example as Alex Scribner sideways in the middle of turns one and two, just completely missed the line, it looked like, caught the fence, and then poor Patrick Crabtree, I think it was, had nowhere to go but right into the back of Alex Scribner. One guy who was not praying for that caution was a 10 of Alex Scribner. Yeah, put that Darlington stripe on a little too hard coming into the turn, and that will slow him down. The wall glue grabs him, and it gets him, puts him right in harm's way in front of that 15 of Patrick Crabtree. So the 50 goes spinning around, and that will bring out the caution flag one more time. And uh, Tony, I'm almost curious. Uh, there were two incidents earlier in this race where cars literally collided into each other, heavy collisions. And now all of a sudden, the yellow flag's coming out when they didn't come out for those. Very curious indeed. Well, Joe, the simple fact is those accidents were on the apron of the racetrack. They were way off the racing groove, off the racing surface. They did not affect the on-track action. The last few incidents, however, have been right on the race surface of the, uh, the sim basically forced to throw the yellow flag. Now, here's exactly what we expected. Everybody from about sixth on back is coming down pit road. Fresh tires, a full tank of virtual Sunoco racing fuel, and this basically puts everybody on equal footing. The leaders might have one or two laps more on their tires, Joe, but essentially now everybody has got a sticker set to run to the finish. That's absolutely right. Now you're going to see the, the, the equalizer come out, if you will, because now at this point, everyone's going to have a lot of the same gear. Everyone's going to have a lot of the same, effectively, a lot of the same tires, and these guys are going to be on the same fuel schedule. And now you're really going to see where driver skill comes into play for each of these drivers because they're going to be looking forward and looking towards digging at this track with everything they have on equal footing. Whoever wins this race from this point on, Tony, will win it on trepidation and skill alone that's a big word joe they'll go fast how about that i like going fast hey what, how, how's it how is the old saying go seconds only the first loser money by speed how fast can you afford to go Ban welcome to banjo speed shop how's that for throwing it back at darling hey tony if you're not first you're last just keep that in mind tell you what i'll be you know what I might have to dig up a prize somehow. If somebody can tell me what or who I'm referring to when I say money by speed, how fast can you afford to go, welcome to Banjo Speed Shop. If you know who in the world I'm talking about, shoot me a message on Twitter or tweet me at tstevens92. I'm not going to promise you anything, but I might be able to dig you up a prize pack or something from the old Banjo Speed Shop. I, um... Uh... I happen to know that answer, but I'm not going to give it away just because I'm curious as to what you're going to give away, Tony. I'm not sure. I'll have to make a few phone calls to see if it's even possible, but I might try if you know what that even means when I'm referring to Banjo Speed Shop. That's, uh, we, we talk about throwbacks and old school and everything else. 
you know the answer to that one, you've been around this deal for a long time. You know, and Darlington's really attractive to showcase that too, is because of how long, how, how much tradition is involved here. They're not running these old school paint schemes, these throwback paint schemes, because it's fun to, to go down memory lane. Uh, Darlington yeah, they is are. a tradition. Well, there, there is that one, but sure. But Darlington is a really a, a tradition that dates back to the early days of NASCAR. This is a track that has storied, that has created champions, has tempered champions. And if you can win here, the gods are you can win anywhere in the circuit especially now joe the way this new dynamic surface model and new tire model has come out to make this a race now that is once again the driver's hands it's not strictly an engineer in the box or a crew chief yeah they can give you a horse to ride but the jockey has still got to pull the reins and that's a little easier said than done here at darlington so i have to congratulate i racing for it's always been the driver's hands don't get me wrong but it is really in the driver's hands now to where they have got to execute flawlessly to win a race no matter what level it's on. The Canada Free Series or a Legends car with a rookie somewhere at Lanier. You've got to be perfect no matter what you do. And that certainly is a, a real testament to how hard the guys up in Massachusetts work here on iRacing. Pace car getting ready to pull off the racing surface. And uh, that's actually Joe as it comes down pit road. We'll see if we can talk about that if we get one more caution before this night is over with but a very new or a new uh, charity iRacing has associated themselves with meanwhile it's a charity benefit he hopes for Chris Overland leader up front the conclusion of lap number 151 32 laps to go and that double clutch Menard Chevrolet is out front setting the pace Ray Alfala is reading down his end Alfala is not going to let this race walk away so easy as you see him just all over the back bumper. All that 47 of Overland. Corey Vincent now in third as we have a battle for position number four. Landon Harrison, Brian Blackford side by side going into turns one and two. Advantage Harrison as he digs under the 33 of Blackford. Score Harrison position number four. Now Harrison has got the newest tires of those that did not pit on this caution flag because he pitted on the most recent caution flag. Overland's got about 10 or 12 laps on his skins. Alfala's in the same boat. And Corey Vinza also came down pit road on that most recent caution flag. And he is now stuck behind Alfala and Overland. Very quickly, Joe, we're going to have ourselves a four-car battle for the lead. And if they're not careful, PJ Sturgis with brand new stickers is going to find his way up there. So will Brian Blackford. And you can really see the difference tires make here, Joe. Look at the closing rate for Landon Harrison and PJ Sturgis at the center of the corner. Everybody else is sliding around, trying to wait to get back to the gas. Those drivers able to crank the wheel, get all the grip they want, and those things are side-biting all the way to the corner and taking them right up to the battle for the point. So Chris Overland still up front. Alfala, Vincent Harrison, and P.J. Sturgis are going to make this a five-car battle for the win here at Darlington. Darlington is now being told the plan B uh, sales car of Brian Day just took a spin uh, coming off of turn number four. That seems to be the very dangerous place to be. Harmless spin, no major issues, so we stayed green. And uh, look at this. Again, top five now, all under a blanket in the front of the field. Officially, the gap just a hair over half a second between the top five and Joe. Chris Overland might have 12 lap older tires. But everybody else has got a very, very narrow racetrack by which they have to pass him on. And here goes Landon Harrison trying to do just that to Corey Vincent, taking full advantage of his newer tires. As Harrison, he will slide up to the third slot in the running order. So Landon Harrison might be taking full advantage of this whole strategy thing, and he might be the underdog trying to pull this one off. Anyone can win it at Darlington, and again, if you win at Darlington, you can win anywhere. Three wide, somewhere here on the track, and they go two by two throughout this field. The leader's now three wide. Wow. Landon Harrison just about stuck his nose in there in turn number three to make it three abreast for the lead. Surprisingly, Ray Alfala not able to make the pass. Neither was Harrison, but now Harrison will get the run off turn number two, and he will very easily at least pull up alongside of Ray Alfala. He's able to drive that car a little bit deeper in the corner. He'll, wow, look at that. He's going to get the two-for-one special. It's a BOGO in turn number three. Landon Harrison to the point. Ray Alfala out of control off the banking. Where on earth did Landon Harrison come from? This is the race of his career. 
definitely a Nitra member for Landon Harrison as he takes the lead for the first time here at Darlington Overland. Alfala, Vincent Sturgis left scratching their heads as Harrison is shot out of a cannon and he is going to be on top of the world here at Darlington. And tires mean the world here at Darlington, Joe, as you can see. Last time by the gap was three tenths of a second. And now the most recent time across the stripe, Harrison stretched it out by six tenths of a second. That's how important tires are. I don't care if it's 10 or 15 laps, that's Darlington for you. That's sticker tires. And Landon Harrison so far has played the strategy to perfection. Now, as this currently sits, the worst thing that could happen to Landon Harrison is a caution, Joe. I do not think the 89 has enough speed to win this race on outright sheer quickness. But I do believe with pit strategy and tire management, he is in the catbird seat as we close in on 22 circuits to go. And a great battle behind him for second and third. I was about to say that battle for second and third and fourth and fifth could absolutely change the complexion of how hard Landon Harrison needs to run. The more infighting those four cars do, the better it is for Harrison, the better he's had an opportunity to start running away from these guys. And it may get to the point of, if I run away far enough, I may not have to do a whole lot to, stay, to keep the win. Now again, if Caution Flag comes out, it changes everything, and then we're really gonna see who's got the better skill, who's got the better tires underneath the car. Overland, I must say, Joe, I'm very impressed. Now, Ray, Al Ray Alfala got around Chris Overland, but Chris Overland has done a yeoman's job of holding off the challenge of everybody behind him. Any other driver, I think, probably would have had a lot of spots relinquished by now, or at least a lot of other drivers. But Chris Overland has done a stellar job to hold on to third and given those guys uh, just an absolute brilliant effort. The double clutch guys have got to be thrilled with this one. And uh, again, it's not over yet, but the more laps that click off, the better the odds for Chris Overland to have a solid top five run. Absolutely, and that's really going to be where you start to see uh, the excitement come in later on down the race. The question, though, is uh, will we get to see that excitement? If Harrison continues to run up front, he continues to run as well as he is, Alfala, Overland, Sturgis may not have the opportunity to catch up with him, but, you know. And we'll see how it all plays out. You know, I'm, I'm kind of impressed, Joe. I did get one text message from somebody watching about the Banjo reference at Banjo Speed Shop, how much money buys speed, how fast can you afford to go? But nobody on Twitter seems to have gotten it. So either use hashtag InPass or just tweet me directly, at tstevens92, and tell me if you know the Banjo reference. If you get the Banjo Speed Shop reference, because I'm kind of, I'm kind of uh, shocked that nobody really has uh, brought it up yet, Joe. It's an old, old reference that is very specific to Darlington, and uh, I don't know that anyone's going to get it. I, I have my doubts. I wouldn't say it's specific to Darlington, but it's specific to old school. Let's put it to you that way. But it's old school that's still very, very, very relevant today. Anyway, up front, Ray Alfala now. He has gotten past Chris Overland and starting to slowly reel in Landon Harrison. Last time by it was 1.576. Well, this time by, never mind. Now the gap extends once again to 1.8 seconds. So Ray Alfala, if he wants a chance at the win, he is going to have to start clicking him off about a tenth of a second faster than Landon Harrison. I'm not so sure that's possible because Harrison is almost two to three tenths a lap faster than anybody else immediately behind him. Another driver I'm very impressed with, Joe, after going up and down through strategy, caution flags that fell at the wrong time and the whole deal. Corey Vincent running in seventh. He's got Dan Denayer on the box calling the shots as a race strategist and crew chief. They've done a solid job to claw back inside the top ten. I don't know that they'll have a shot to win this race yet the way it currently sits, but very impressive Corey Vincent. And that's a championship tight effort where you can have a night like this where things just don't go right and still get a solid, solid run out of it. His, his race might end up in the top five, depending on what happens with the two cars in the front of them, Brian Blackford and Jake Sturgis. A couple of 
from laps ago. Those two were battling nose to tail, uh, back and forth, and there was a lot of skittish movement going on uh, between those two cars. Now, as those two cars continue to run nose to tail, there's still some opportunities there uh, for something to go wrong between the 33, running one of the old, one of the old school Wendell Scott Foundation uh, paint schemes, and the 41 of Jake Sturgis. So don't count out Corey Vincent yet. He might be a recipient of luck, depending what happens with the, thir the 33 and the 41. Just maybe. Again. Hey, there's a lot of maybes playing out. You see the leaders going by now. Michael Conti on the back straight away. He cannot hold on to his peak Chevrolet much longer, so he is forced to come in for tires. And Ray Alfala has been back and forth, back and forth. Gain two tenths, lose a tenth. Gain two tenths, lose a tenth. This time by, he gained two tenths. Ray Alfala has got a second and a half of Landon Harrison, but he's only got 13 laps to get the job done, Joe. This one's going to be close. I think Alfala is faster, but I'm not so sure he's got enough time. I don't think he's got enough time either. I think that the, the, the clock is running out, and I think if anyone wants to try to get around Lando Harrison, they're going to need the help of Mr. Caution Flag, which there's no guarantees he's going to come out uh, this late in the race. Well, the more spread out this field gets, the more likely that it's not going to happen. Not possible, obviously, by any means, but certainly not as likely if the field continues to get stretched out. The difference being here, Joe, with this new surface model, the new tire model, how everybody is complaining this racetrack is getting freer and freer and freer. You might see somebody simply lose it on their own, but as we get closer to the end of this one, now with only 11 laps to go for Landon Harrison, if the yellow comes out, we're getting more and more into a situation where we might not see the green flag reemerge. The gap now from the leader back to second, 1.35 seconds, and still, not going to be enough if Alfala picks up a tenth of a second a lap. He's got to start finding some speed. He's got to do something out there. So 33 and 36 almost get, get into it coming into the turn. The 36 has to hit the brakes hard as now the 33 starting to wiggle. Brian Blackford starting to show some chinks in the armor as now here comes 36 of Justin Bolton. He's going to try to get around him. No dice this time around, uh, but the riding may be on the wall for Brian Blackford. Could be running in sixth spot. He might have himself his hands full with Bolton, Vincent, Hudson, and others as they try to find a way around that Wendell Scott tribute number 33. And he's he's kind of in the same boat as a uh, a um, Chris Overland. He's about 10 to 12 laps older on tires than anybody else, Joe. And once again, speaking of older tires, Al Fowler, who's on those older skins, lost more time that time around to Landon Harrison. The gap now almost a second and a half for the number 89, back to the runner-up of Ray Alfala. And here's the other thing that Ray Alfala has to keep in mind, Joe. While Kenny Humphrey came in tonight needing to gain, what, 35 points to clinch the championship, I believe it was? Alfala is knocking into that lead somewhat, but it really doesn't matter because the 58 of Kenny Humphrey, he's being scored 22nd. He's gonna pick up about 20 points in the championship. Not enough to officially clinch it, but he might as well go ahead and cash the check. Hey, as Yogi Berra once said, it ain't over till it's over. Don't, yes, he's going to get close, but don't, you know, put his name on the check just yet. Make him earn it before he, before he starts spending the money. Very true, Joe. By the way, Twitter lit up a little bit. Some Andrew Plank, really the first person to uh, at least get in the ballpark. David Allen says he gets the reference. It's old school and it's nice to hear it again. But uh, Plank is very, very close. Very, very close. If nobody gets it by the end of the broadcast, we'll throw it out there and give everybody a little bit of a history lesson. But uh, yeah, money buys speed. How fast can you afford to go? Welcome to Banjo Speed Shop. You're a little fixated on that, aren't you? It's an old school kind of day. Yeah. You're telling me. And it's an old school kind of race. I mean, we've got tire strategy, we've got guys slipping and sliding, we've got people getting Darlington stripes, people running the back of one another. This is the quintessential type of racing we all fell in love with, we all grew to be affectionate for, and once again, Darlington never disappoints. Every now and then you find the right lady in a little black dress, and she is all you ever wanted. Tonight, Darlington is that lady in black. Nothing either one of us know anything about. 
Nonetheless, five laps to go here at Darlington. <laughs> As Landon Harrison continues to lead, Ray Alfala now in second. Chris Overland, BJ Sturgis, and Jay Sturgis rounding out your top five. And it's really now up to all in the hands of the uh, of the 83 and the 89 machine. Now is a land Nathan Wise having had major trouble. Heavy smoke pouring out of that number 24 machine. Not sure what happened to him, but they were. You got to be grateful that did not bring out a caution because it very easily could have. Oh, Landon Harrison. If the caution came out at this point, Landon Harrison would be just like a pig in slop. He would be thrilled because if the yellow came out now, this race would be over because we would not have a chance to go back green. Still sideways further back, all kinds of drivers slapping the fence as we get down to crunch time. Three circuits to go for Landon Harrison. The gap in excess of a second and a half. Landon Harrison, I believe, Joe, is well on way to the upset win here at Darlington. I don't think anybody would have picked this one out of a hat. If you went to Vegas, his odds probably were about 600 to one coming into the season. You know, it, that just makes the, the victory that much sweeter as popsicle sticks uh, come in the air for Landon Harrison. Two more circuits around Darlington and he will have tamed the track that is too tough to tame. Ray Alfala still in second. Chris Overland, PJ Sturgis, Jake Sturgis rounding out your top five. And as you look at the gaps between those all three of all five of those drivers, uh, 1.3 seconds between Alfala and Harrison, three seconds, uh, almost again, a second and a half between Alfala and Overland. His top three is locked in and uh, pending doom to one of these drivers. The big bed sheet is in the air. White flag over the Darlington Raceway for Landon Harrison. He started 32nd on the field. One of the final drivers to make a qualifying effort. He played pit strategy and tire management to perfection. And he'll navigate the narrow confines, the turns three and four. And the lady in black has picked herself a date. Tonight, his name is Landon Harrison, the winner of the Peak Southern 250 at Darlington Raceway in the NASCAR Peak Antifree Series. Ray Alfala comes home second, followed by Chris Overland, PJ Sturgis, and Jake Sturgis in fifth. Wow, what a race at Darlington, Joe. Every single bit about it was old school here tonight. The championship not officially sewn up for Kenny Humpy but it's pretty doggone close. It's that much closer to him cashing a $10,000 check, but still can't quite etch his name on the trophy just yet. Very, very, very close, though. He could have had an opportunity here tonight, but there was a little bit of, not tragedy, I think tragedy is the wrong word, considering the time of the year, but I think there's a little bit of um, bad luck on his end that ultimately did not uh, do it. But you know what? We go back to it next week where we're at a much little bit friendlier track, and he's got two more opportunities to put his name on the check. But forget that for tonight. Tonight, it's all about Landon Harrison putting the 89 machine into victory lane at a well-deserved win at Darlington. Well-earned, well-deserved, and by far an upset victory. The old 89 kind of throws it back to Morgan Shepard. You want to talk about old school and some throwbacks? It says Flam on the side. He flammed the field here tonight, and uh, might as well break out the roller skates because the 89 is in victory lane here at Darlington. What a race for Landon Harrison. I'm sure he will be thinking about this one for quite a while, and we'll be looking forward to Chicago and Homestead coming up. Before we do all that and preview those events, we'll take a quick break, come back, and we'll talk to Harrison, Al Fowler, and others here at Darlington. Don't go away. Sorry guys, I never would have thought making duck calls would have stirred up this much excitement. No oh, kidding. We got him coming up here. Shortcut time! Woo! Yeah. That's what I'm talking about! Ah. You sure this is a good idea? Oh yeah, I got this. I can't guarantee you how this will end, but Pete can guarantee your radiator for life. Introducing the Peak Run True Guarantee. Check it out at peakguarantee.com.
Sorry, guys. I never thought making duck calls would have stirred up this much excitement. No kidding. We got him coming up here. Shortcut time! Yeah. That's what I'm talking about! Ah. You sure this is a good idea? Oh, yeah. I got this. I can't guarantee you how this will end. But Pete can guarantee your radiator for life. Introducing the Peak Run True Guarantee. Check it out at peakguarantee.com. All righty, well, we've got some technical difficulties here, it looks like, once again, <laughs> but uh, I guess we would not We would have that if it would be uh, live shows. Live shows, got to love them. Nonetheless, we are back here at Darlington for the NASCAR Pecanna Free Series Peak Southern 250, and what a race it was, Joe. Just simply stellar, and I believe you were somewhere down there in all the chaos amongst the guy that has picked up his very first career NASCAR Pecana Free Series win the upset of upsets this season with Landon Harrison. Six lead changes tonight, but only one matters for Landon Harrison because he's going to walk away with his very first NASCAR Pecana Free Series win. And Landon, I got to ask, what's it mean to get it at Darlington? Oh my God, Joe! Uh, like, I know you're going to get uh, to asking about the top twenty, but like, I really wanted to win one of these one of these things one of these one of these days, and just uh, at Darlington, I actually got my best finish here, like last year, and like you know, I didn't think the car was too bad, and just well, like got in the race, and <laughs> it was just it was just on rails, and I don't know, it just it means so much to me to get at Darlington, and and uh, the new surface model and the new tires, and oh man. Let's talk about that the new the new tire model, the new track wear model, the dynamic track. Uh, how much? of that did you work on this week learning the new system and more importantly that did any of that practice help factor into your win tonight well like i know everybody probably did a lot of practice for this race not necessarily at darlington but just throughout the week of different tracks but to simulate a situation with you know 40 cars on a single group track you can't really do much for that and i imagine that nobody including me had no idea what was going to happen you know, after like halfway, uh, towards the end there, I saw the groove getting really dark, and like gradually over the course of the race, it started to get more of a handful, but it's like the car just didn't fall off that much, and I don't know, it was, <laughs> I just, I was just able to find uh, more speed than the other guys and just, uh, just pass them. Real quick, how much fun was it to race around here uh, compared to last year to this year with the new tire model, the new dynamic track? Oh, it is a lot more fun. Uh, lately, these cars have been on rails, like too much downforce, too much grip everywhere, everywhere we go, and we don't have much fall off. But tonight, it's like, like you know, 50 laps into a run, you see like three seconds of fall off. And before that, like halfway through a run, you're just try not to get on the gas too much or else you're going to spin and then by the end you're just wheeling and like it's really hard to control <laughs> like trust me i'm really sweating right now <laughs> and like it's it's really hard work but it, it pays off now you mentioned it the onset of this interview coming into this race you were on the bubble you were at that top 20 position with this win and with some bad luck from a couple other drivers in front of you your bubble's going to increase how nice is it how good does it feel to know that bearing part without any other problems this season you're going to be back for 2016 in the nascar pecania free series 
Well, yeah, be careful because it's not, season not over. Anything can happen. But that's definitely uh, definitely having that cushion is really nice. I can uh, breathe a little bit, uh, take it a little more conservatively for the next few races uh, because like it just seems like no matter what, I couldn't get away from that top 20 right on that bubble. And like every week I was having to go into the race worrying about uh, trying not to get involved into an accident and worrying about uh, what my competitors were doing. So it's like this win, like it's, it's great to win. And yeah, it also takes a load off for me uh, for worrying about the top 20. Landon Harrison picks up his first win by dancing with a lady in black at Darlington. Landon Harrison, your winner tonight here in the Peak Southern 250. Tony Stevens has caught up with the second uh, second place finisher, the two-time champion, Ray Alfala. Good news for Ray Alfala. A solid run here tonight in second. Bad news, the championship has two races left. We'll talk about that in a minute. But, Ray, I think you had the dominant car here tonight. What was the difference in going to victory lane? Was it simply a difference of the what seemed like a little bit, only you know, 10 or 12 laps on tires? Oh, I have I have no idea, Tony. Uh, Landon speed caught me totally off guard there. Uh, I just really have no idea what, what happened there. But, uh, you know, just it's disappointing. You know, we uh, came into the race. We thought we had a pretty good long run car, and, and it showed. And uh, But, you know, it's... It's always a uh, it's always a little disappointing to finish second, but especially when you lead the most laps. And uh, but but anyway, you know, on to more important things. Uh, it is uh, P Pediat Pediatric Cancer Awareness Month, as it's also on the pace car. And uh, wanna mention that Wendell Scott's great grandson Trey Davis was uh, diagnosed with brainstem glioma a few months ago. And unfortunately, through his radiation therapy, he uh, he needs 24-hour care because it affected his brainstem, so he's bedridden. And there is a GoFundMe. It's uh, gofundme.com slash trayday. That's T-R-E-Y-D-A-Y. And so just want to give uh, give Trey's family a shout-out. Um, you know, thoughts and prayers to them. We had the throwback Wendell Scott colors tonight, and uh, that's why it's, you know, that's why it's pretty heartbreaking not to, to come home with, with the victory with the, with the way that the, the race played out, but um regarding the championship i'm not really thinking about that I, I figured kenny's way out there i know he had some troubles tonight but he he can pretty much have that same night for the next you know for the last two races and still win it so you know at this point i'm just trying to go out there and do the best that i can and that deficit now sits at 90 points being that 48 points is the maximum you can earn per race you need a 96-point gap to clinch the championship. In other words, Kenny Humphrey needs to make six points over the next two races. And that's assuming you win every race and lead every lap race. So I think you're right. It's essentially in the bag for Kenny Humphrey. But that has to open things up for you now where you can worry about race wins. And let's talk about this new track model, this new tire you've got on the car, the new rules package. What is your impression? It looked to be a handful, but as race fans over the years, we love watching race car drivers have a handful and have a challenge on their hand. Was that what the case was behind behind the wheel? It was it was a lot of fun. Um, you know, we, we really didn't know what to expect. Uh, I've run a few races uh, this week after the dynamic tracks came out, and, but there haven't really been enough cars on the track, I guess you could say, and we haven't gone green long enough for the track to really rubber in. But it was really cool to see the rubber get put on the racetrack and how dark the groove got and there's like three seconds of fall off we've been asking for fall off for so long and now it's here it's here in like in a big way so you know it's it's fun being able to to control more as a driver out there and and to for this you know when the speeds go down you really have to take care of of the right rear scene especially and um you know what i mean good job to landon you know he uh <laughs> The uh, I've raced against Landon, I think, now for almost 10 years, so that's pretty cool that he gets uh, his first win. Uh, you, you know, it's, it's always disappointing when you you know you want you see somebody that you want to win, but you're like, well, you know, if if they win, I hope I don't finish second. <laughs> but you know, that was the case tonight. Uh, uh, so good job to him, and good job to everyone else. Um, Slip Angle and Lastro, I think we finished second through sixth. Uh, so. Really, really strong showing by our team. Uh, thanks a lot to Joey Brown, PJ Sturgis for putting a lot of time to the setup, and and everyone else for all the feedback they give. Uh, it feels good to 
to have a really good team effort. You don't you don't want just one car running near the front and everybody else struggling. So to put uh you know four cars in well like it's five cars in the top six. You know it's uh it's a pretty awesome team effort. Certainly is. That's Ray Alfala finishing second here tonight at Darlington. Joe has caught up with the guy that followed him to the finish line and finished in third place. Chris Overland may be in a candidate for the Hard Charger Award as he started 27th and will finish position number three. Uh, Chris, I know you, you had a car that you felt like could have won tonight, could have won tonight, but third isn't bad. Absolutely, the car could have won tonight. It was amazing. Um, once the green flag dropped, I knew I knew something special about uh, there was something special about this number 47 double clutch Menard Chevrolet. It certainly was. It certainly looked like a car that was that, that was on a mission tonight. How difficult was it piling this car with the new tire model and the new dynamic track model uh, in in play here? Well, it didn't seem as difficult for me as it was for everybody else. So that, that that's a positive. I guess we'll take that. Um, I actually had to change my wheel settings because with the old wheel settings, I was just I was not up to par, and and now I'm. So on, on new wheel settings, I was able to come up through the field. It wasn't too difficult. It wasn't too difficult, but definitely had a challenge. Let me ask you this. Uh, how much more fun was it to race with this new model as opposed to previous models where you really do see these cars struggle towards the end of a run? Well, I, I won't glorify it and say it's the best thing ever. It, it's not where it needs to be yet, but it was definitely a lot better. You could pass people when they were when they were holding you up. Uh, if somebody was slower, they didn't usually uh, stay ahead of you too long. So you, you could maneuver lanes. And once once the groove got rubbered in, it was actually, it got really fun. So uh, it it still needs to be worked on, obviously, and I'm sure iRacing knows that. But uh, I, I it's a huge step up from where we were. Chris, coming in tonight, you were six in points. What is the goal now for the rest of the season? Are we going to try to? Are you going to be trying to work your way up into one of those top five money positions, or is top ten good enough for you and the team? Um, well, I'm fourth now when points updated, so we're going to try to go get PJ in third there, and uh, hopefully, uh, just finish off the season strong. And man, tonight I really wanted that win, so. Uh, I don't know, Chicago will try again, Homestead will try again. Hopefully we end up uh, capitalizing and nothing bad happens those two races and we can uh, finish off the season top three in points, top two in points maybe if Ray has any bad luck. But um, so far, I'm just going with the flow. Uh, no, no real plan for the rest of the season, just run as best as we can, minimize mistakes. Chris Overland finishes third, ends up fourth in points, is looking for a little bit of money when it's all said and done in the NASCAR Piganda Free Series. Tony Thank Stevens you. is caught up with one of the Sturgises, P.J. Sturgis finishing fourth. And P.J., right ahead of his brother Jake, and uh, we talked about it, P.J., you very quietly have had a career season in the NASCAR Piganda Free Series once again tonight, a top five run. How did you... How did you do it, number one? Because it's so different, I'm sure, from what you've had to do to get a top five any other race in the series. Yeah, that was a, a really fun race. Hats off to Landon on the win. I mean, I think this, everybody is going to be happy to see him pull off the W tonight. But, uh, yeah, it was a weird top five. But, man, what a fun race, these dynamic tracks. At the end, I thought the track would loosen up, but it went the other way. and I didn't really free the car up enough for it. So uh, it was all I could just to keep it out of the fence. I wanted to get by Chris, but didn't want to take out my teammate in the process. So really good night for the team, uh, the whole alliance with five of us in the top six. So, yeah, it's definitely a great feeling to pull that kind of runoff tonight. You've got a couple of races to go. What have you got set ahead for yourself in these final two events coming up in the next three weeks? Well, Chicagoland is usually a pretty good track for me, but uh, we have to keep preparing really hard. I mean, we did a lot of preparation for this race, and it paid off, so we're going to kind of have to do the same here to uh, keep this run going, this momentum going. Uh, it's a tricky track. Homestead has never been a good one for me, so hopefully the points aren't too tight going in, but um, you never know what can happen in these races. Try to Keep your head on you. Keep cool during the race and play the strategy right. It's really the key here.
So PJ Sturgis finishes in the fourth spot here tonight. And uh, again, congratulations, PJ, on a solid run. Joe Cortez has caught up with the other half of the Sturgis clan, and that is his brother, Jake. Well, if you're going to lose this, if you're going to drop a position to somebody, you might as well have it dropped to your brother. And, and Jake, let me ask you this. You had a fifth place finish. Is, is it a little bittersweet or a little sour that you lost that one position to your brother? Oh, it's always disappointing when you get beat by PJ. Uh, he lets me know about it for the next week or so till the next race. He's like, oh, I beat you in NASCAR. And yeah, so he's got that on me. But I'll take a fifth place for sure. And I wasn't going to try anything crazy at the end there. It's so hard to pass here. I, I just didn't want to wreck him or me. Not, a, not at the end like that. Definitely a new learning curve, having to learn this new uh, system with a new dynamic track and the tire model. How much of that of that tire model and tra dynamic track played into your strategy and or ultimately your fifth place finish tonight? I think it played a big part in it. Uh, just keeping the car clean is a big thing at Darlington. But I wasn't really sure what the track was going to do there at the end. It seemed to tighten up a little bit, but started off the setup on the tight side anyway. And the first run, it was really good. I fell way to the back there just riding around and just was going by people as they were sliding all over the place hitting the wall and i don't know they were really struggling but our setup was just hooked up seems like we got a really good handle on this new build and really excited for the next race jake you came into this race ninth in points you're looking at getting some prize money and maybe even a trophy at the end of the season What's next for the next two races? Are we going to see you racing aggressively without the worry of being back in the NASCAR Big Free Series for 2016? Or are we going to see you play a conservative and just walk away with the iRacing credit? Oh, we'll see how it plays out. Looks like I got a shot at fourth in points. It, not too far back, 22 points out of fourth. So anything could happen here. One big wreck could take out a lot of people. You never know what will happen. And uh, yeah, Chris. Um, yeah, Chris is up there in points. PJ's up there. I don't think I can catch PJ, but uh, we got a good shot. And top 10 in points would be great. Top four in points would be even better. So we'll see how it plays out. I just want to thank the guys down at Lastro Motorsports and Slip Angle Motorsports for all the hard work they put in on the setups every week. It really pays off. Jake Storr just started this race 34th, walks away 5th, which shows you that uh, anyone, it's really anyone's race when it comes to Darlington. Tony, great racing tonight, always a pleasure. And as we look towards the last two races of the 2015 season, lots of changes to take, to, to take a look at and lots of changes to prepare for as we get ready to put this season to bed. But one guy who's ready to put the season to bed, uh, aside from me, that is, is... Uh, is Kenny Humphy, who now, as, as we were talking before during the commercial break, has a seven-point gap to lock in the championship. So this, I'm sorry, six-point gap that can lock in this championship uh, by the end of the season. So by the this time, uh, in one week's time, we could be putting the NASCAR Peak Antifree Series to bed, as it were, uh, as well as my own career with the NASCAR Peak Antifree Series. Uh, but, you know, all good things must come to an end. And uh, this is going to be a very bittersweet uh, season to put an end to, Tony. Oh, thank goodness that joke. Oh, um, sorry. Um, yeah, no, just kidding, Joe. We'll certainly miss you. But, hey, we're going to enjoy the good times while we certainly can. And I'm sure everybody else will miss you as well. Of course, we're missing Tim Terry tonight. He's somewhere off in Canada land doing who knows what. No clue. But I'm sure he's doing Canadian stuff of something. But we'll see him in one week's time at the Chicago Land Speedway. And hope to see you there as well. Don't miss it. We're doing the back-to-back -back thing these next, uh, well, these last two weeks. We did the Xfinity Series B-Class cars back-to-back. -back. And now this week and next week, back-to-back -back with the NASCAR Peak and Free Series. We fully expect Kenny Humpy to clinch a championship at Chicago don't miss it, and you get to see the next race in the dynamic surface, the new tire model, the new rules package, the whole deal. If it's anywhere as close to entertaining as this one was, we are in for a treat, both at Chicago and at Homestead Miami Speedway. Despite the championship being over, there are still races to run, and it's going to be fun because everybody has one thing to gun for now, and that's wins. On behalf of Ian Bushing, Matt Thomas, Chuck Johnson, 
Joe Cortez, Ilka Happel, the entire PSR TV staff, and those at Fans Choice. My name's Tony Stevens saying we'll see you same time, same channel next week for the NASCAR Peak Free Series live from Chicagoland. Good night, everybody.